Good evening. My name is Fred Neuhauser. I'm the chair of the philosophy department um, here at Barnard. And I'm very happy to welcome you tonight to Barnard College and to this lecture by Noam Chomsky sponsored by the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. The last time I heard Professor Chomsky speak was in the mid 80s when I was a graduate student here. And if I remember correctly, this, the talk was held in this very same room. It's a little bit depressing for me to think that his talk that evening, almost 30 years ago, could have borne the same title that his talk has tonight, which, as you already know, is America and Israel-Palestine, War and Peace. Among other topics, Professor Chomsky will address how the United States' strategic alliance with Israel affects the process of peace in the Middle East, and why the US is so involved in that region in the first place. Our time tonight is very limited, and for that reason, I'm going to forego a long introduction. We'll start right off with Professor Chomsky's lecture, which will last perhaps 40 minutes, and that should leave us about 40 minutes after that for questions and answers. Before I turn the podium over to him, I'd like to just mention and recommend to you one of his most recent books that's directly relevant to the topic tonight. This book, um, which is co-authored with Ilan Pape, is called Gaza in Crisis, Reflections on Israel's War Against the Palestinians. It's published by Haymarket Books, and they're at the back of the room and have plenty of copies of that book and other books for sale if you'd like to pick one up after the lecture. I think we'll just move right into Professor Chomsky's lecture. I'm very honored to present to you Professor Noam Chomsky. Actually, uh, I didn't pick the title for that book. If I had, I would have called it uh, the U.S. War Against the Palestinians, which I think is more significant, certainly for us. Uh, well, a good place to uh, start uh, this discussion is a, a useful concept that I'll borrow from a British diplomat, a young British diplomatic historian, uh, Mark Curtis, in his important and uh, I might add, therefore, neglected uh, works on post-World uh, post War II British uh, crimes, of which there are many. Uh, he uh, makes a distinction between a people and what he calls unpeople. Uh, unpeople are those who sort of look human, but are not considered uh, worthy of uh, elementary human rights. And that happens to be a very crucial distinction for this topic. Come to it soon. But just first notice that the distinction is uh, ever present. Uh, so uh, a couple, about a week ago, the New York Times had a headline saying, the West celebrates a cleric's death. Uh, the cleric was uh, a lucky, killed by a drone. It wasn't just death, it was assassination and another step forward in Obama's uh, global assassination campaign, which actually breaks some new uh, records in international terrorism. Well, it's not true that everyone in the West celebrated. Uh, there were some critics. Uh, almost all of the critics, of whom there weren't many, uh, criticized the action or qualified it because of the fact that al was an American citizen. Uh, that is, he was a person. Uh, unlike suspects who are intentionally murdered or collateral damage, meaning we treat them kind of like the ants we step on when we walk down the street. Uh, they're uh, not American citizens, so they are unpeople, and therefore they can be freely uh, murdered. It's, it's, some may remember, if you have good memories, that there used to be a concept in Anglo-American law called a presumption of innocence, uh, innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Now that's so deep in history that there's no point even bringing it up, but it did once 
exist. Uh, some of the critics uh, brought up the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which says that no person, person, notice, shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well, of course, that was never intended to apply to persons, so it wasn't intended to apply to unpeople and unpeople fall into several categories. There's first of all the indigenous population, either in the territories already held or those that were expected to be uh, conquered soon. It didn't apply to them. And of course it didn't apply to those who the Constitution uh, declared to be three-fifths human, so therefore unpeople. Uh, that latter category was transferred into theoretically into the category of people by the 14th Amendment, uh, that uh, essentially the same wording as the Fifth Amendment in this respect, but now a person was intended to hold of uh, freed slaves. Uh, that was in theory. Uh, in practice, it barely happened. Uh, after about 10 years, uh, the category of three-fifths human were returned to the uh, category of unpeople by the device of uh, criminalization of black life, which essentially restored slavery, maybe something even worse than slavery, actually went on until the Second World War. And it's being uh, reinstituted now, past 30 years of severe uh, moral and uh, social regression in the United States. Well, the Fourth Amend 14th Amendment was recognized right away to be problematic. Uh, the concept of person was both too narrow and uh, too broad. And the courts went to work to overcome both of those flaws. Uh, the concept of person was expanded to include uh, uh, legal uh, fictions uh, sustained, created and sustained by the state, what's called corporations. And it was also narrowed over the years to exclude uh, undocumented aliens. That goes right up to the present, the recent Supreme Court cases, which make it clear that uh, the corporations not only are persons, but uh, they're persons with rights far beyond those of persons of flesh and blood, so kind of super persons. Uh, the mislabeled free trade agreements uh, give them astonishing rights, and of course the court has added more. Uh, but uh, the uh, crucial need to uh, make sure that the category of unpeople includes those who uh, escaped from the horrors we've created in Central America and Mexico, try to get here, those are not persons, they are unpeople. Uh, the, uh, and of course it includes uh, any uh, foreigners, especially those accused of terror, which is a concept that has taken a quite an interesting uh, conceptual change, an interesting one, since 1981 when Ronald Reagan came into office and uh, declared the global war on terror, what's called the GWAT in current fancy terminology. Uh, I won't go into that here, except with a comment to note on how the term is now used uh, without any raising even any notice. So take, for example, Omar Khadr. He's a 15-year-old child, uh, Canadian. Uh, he was accused of a very severe crime, uh, namely trying to defend his village in Afghanistan from uh, U.S. invaders. Obviously, that's severe crime, serious terrorist, so he was sent first to secret prison in Bagram, then off to Guantanamo uh, for eight years. Uh, after eight years, he uh, uh, pleaded guilty to some charges. Uh, we all know what that means. Uh, if you want, if you, if you pick up a few of the details, even in Wikipedia and more and other sources. So he pleaded guilty and was given eight more years uh, a sentence. He could, would have gotten 30 more years if he hadn't pleaded guilty. After all, it is a severe crime defending your village from American aggressors. Uh, he's Canadian, so Canada could have him extradited, but with uh, typical courage, uh, they refused. 
Uh, they don't want to offend the master, understandably. Well, the crime of uh, uh, resisting uh, aggression is not a new category of terrorism. There may be some of you old enough to remember the slogan, uh, terror against terror, uh, which was used by the Gestapo and which we've taken over. Uh, the, uh, none of this arouses any interest uh, because all of these the victims believe belong to the category of unpeople. Well, that coming back to our topic now, the concept of unpeople is central to uh, tonight's topic. Uh, Israeli Jews are people. Uh, Palestinians are unpeople. And a lot follows from that. Uh, it's clear illustrations constantly. So here's a clipping, if I remember to bring it from the New York Times. Uh, Front page story, uh, Wednesday, October 12th. Uh, the lead story is uh, deal with Hamas will free Israeli held since 2006. It's Gilad Shalit. And right next to it is uh, running right across the top of the front page is a picture of uh, four women kind of agonized over the fate of Gilad Shalit. Uh, Friends and supporters of the family of uh, Staff Sergeant Gilad Shalit received word of the deal at the family's protest tent in Jerusalem. Well, that's understandable, actually. I think he should have been released a long time ago. Uh, but uh, uh, there's something missing from this whole story. So like there's no pictures of Palestinian women. Uh, no discussion, in fact, in the story of uh, what about the Palestinian prisoners being uh, released. Where do they come from? And uh, there's a lot to say about that. So, for example, we don't know, at least I don't read it in the Times, whether the release includes the Palestinian, the elected Palestinian officials who were kidnapped and imprisoned by Israel in 2007 when the United States, you know, the European Union, and Israel decided, decided to dissolve the only freely elected legislature in the Arab world. That's called democracy promotion, technically, in case you're not familiar with the term. Uh, the, uh, so I don't know what happened to them. Uh, there are also other people who've uh, been in prison exactly as long as Gilad Shalit, in fact, one day longer. Uh, the day before Gilad Shalit was captured uh, at the border, uh, Israeli troops entered Gaza, uh, kidnapped two brothers, the Muammar brothers, uh, spirited them across the border in violation of the Geneva Conventions, of course, and they've disappeared into Israel's prison system. I have no clue what happened to them. I've never seen a word about it. And as far as I know, nobody cares, which makes sense, after all, unpeople. Uh, whatever you think about capturing the soldier, a soldier from an attacking army, uh, plainly kidnapping civilians is a far more severe crime. Uh, but that's only if they're people. In this case, it really doesn't magic matter. It's not that it's unknown. So if you look back at the price at the press the day after the Muammar brothers were captured, there's a couple of lines here and there, uh, but it's just insignificant, of course which makes some sense because there are lots of others in prison, uh, thousands of them, uh, many in, uh, without charges. Uh, there's also, in addition to this, the secret prison system like uh, facility 1391, if you want to look it up on the internet, uh, secret prison, which means, of course, a torture chamber in Israel, which uh, actually was reported pretty well in Israel when it was discovered, also reported in England and in Europe, but I haven't seen a word about it here, I'm at least anywhere that anybody's likely to look. I've written about it and a couple of others. Uh, 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 all of this is, uh, these are all unpeople, so naturally nobody cares. In fact, the racism is so profound that it's kind of like the air we breathe. We're unaware of it, you know, just perver pervades everything. Uh, coming to the title of this talk, it could mislead and, and uh, it, it could be interpreted, misinterpreted as uh, supporting a kind of conventional P 
picture of the negotiations, such as they are, uh, uh, United States on uh, over here, and then these two uh, recalcitrant forces over there. The United States is an honest broker trying to bring together uh, the uh, the two uh, militant. Uh, difficult uh, groups that uh, don't seem to be able to get along with one another. Now that's, uh, uh, that is the standard version, but it's uh, totally false. I mean, if there were serious negotiations, uh, they would be uh, organized by some neutral party, uh, maybe Brazil, and on one side you'd have the U.S. and Israel, on the other side you'd have the world. Uh, that's literally true. Uh, but that's... Uh, one of those things that's unspeakable. Uh, although it's, uh, uh, it's very clear, if you look at the record, I'll just give a few of the high points or maybe low points which illustrate this much richer record. So let's go back uh, at 40 years, in 1971. In 1971, uh, the US and Israel made a, one of their most important decisions uh, it had a lot of consequences. Uh, Egypt uh, offered Israel a full peace treaty in return for withdrawal from the territories, and all they cared about was, all Sadat cared about was Egyptian territory, the Sinai. At that time, Israel was beginning to implement uh, major plans for settlement in the Egyptian Sinai. It was going to be a new city, Amit, supposedly a million people, Jewish, of course, uh, settlements. Uh, you know, kibbutzim, others, uh, they were driving thousands of uh, peasants, uh, Bedouin, into the desert, uh, and destroying towns, and mosques, cemeteries, on and on. And uh, they had a choice. Uh, incidentally, this offer by Sadat said absolutely nothing about the Palestinians. Uh, he also regarded them as unpeople. And so there was a few phrases about refugees, which didn't mean anything, but nothing about Palestinian rights. Uh, Israel considered the uh, offer and decided to reject it, uh, saying they would not retreat to the uh, 67 borders, uh, the internationally recognized border. Uh, Jordan made a similar proposal shortly after. I don't think that one was even answered. Uh, the crucial question always is, what's the master going to do? And in fact, if you go to Washington, there was an internal debate over it. Uh, there was a split in, in the government. Uh, uh, William Rogers, Secretary of State, and the State Department were apparent, apparently in favor of accepting Sadat's offer. And certainly, we don't have a good documentary record from this period, so it has to be kind of pieced together. But uh, so it looks as though uh, uh, Rogers was in favor of it. It was pretty much like his own proposals. Uh, Henry Kissinger at the time was trying hard to uh, displace, the, he was National Security Advisor, to displace the State Department. I think the State Department was his biggest enemy in the world. I mean, way down below somewhere was Russia and somebody else. But uh, uh, if the State Department said it was raining, he would tell Nixon, the sun's shining. Uh, and, and this went on until he finally kicked out Rogers and took over. Well, since Rogers was in favor of it, Kissinger was, of course, against it. And he explains it. If you read his memoirs, he says he was in favor of what he calls stalemate meaning no negotiations, just force. And it's uh, kind of understandable to a person who believes in nothing but force, what's called a realist in international relations theory. Uh, it looked as though uh, uh, Israel had all the force. Uh, if you read the uh, internal record from Israel at the time, which is quite interesting, uh, the line was, uh, Arabs don't know which end of the gun to hold. You know, we can do anything we like. Uh, so why bother? Uh, so Kissinger went along with the Israeli rejection and rejection of the Jordanian proposal, which turned out to be quite significant. Uh, that uh, Sadat kept trying to convince the US to accept his offer to become basically a satellite. He kicked out the Russians, uh, did everything he could, made it very clear that if Israel continues to uh, build in the Sinai, uh, there'd be war. Uh, Yamit means, Yamit was the name of the town, Yamit city, in fact, Yamit means war, he said. 
But nobody paid any attention. You know, Arabs don't know which end of the gun to hold. Uh, then came the 1973 war. Turned out they did know which end of the gun to hold. In fact, it was a very close thing for Israel. They you know, barely survived. Last-minute shipments of arms kind of saved them. Uh, and they understood this a problem. The Kissinger understood too. He does understand force. I don't know if he understands anything else, but he recognized that uh, uh, Arabs just can't be disregarded. Uh, then starts the famous shuttle diplomacy, uh, uh, leading to a Nobel Prize for peace. Uh, and finally, in 1979, 78, 79, uh, the Camp David agreements, uh, in which, in effect, uh, the U.S. and Israel accepted Sadat's 1971 offer, except that they accepted in a, from their point of view, a harsher form, because by the 70s, the issue of Palestinian national rights had kind of entered you know, international agenda, so they were at least compelled to make some gestures towards Palestinian national rights. This is regarded as a diplomatic triumph in American diplomatic history great triumph of Carter and Kissinger. It's actually a, a di diplomatic catastrophe. Uh, by fa refusing to accept peace when it was offered, they, led, they opened the way to a very significant war, which incidentally came pretty close to being a nuclear war, but it's barely managed to escape and finally accepted what they'd rejected in 1971, though in a harsher form. Well, that's 1971. Uh, meanwhile, other things had happened. As I mentioned, the Palestinian issue of, of national rights uh, began to appear by the mid-70s, and in 1976, there came another critical event, also wiped out of history, uh, and you can find it if you really search, but uh, uh, sort of politically incorrect, so not noticed. In January 1976, the three uh, major Arab st states, so-called confrontation states, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, uh, brought to the Security Council a resolution uh, calling for a two-state settlement. That was the first official international reference to the notion of a Palestinian state, a two-state settlement on the international border, internationally recognized border, pre-June pre 67, with uh, uh, guarantees for the right of every state in the region, Israel and Palestine, uh, to exist in peace and security within secure and uh, recognized boundaries. Uh, that soon became an overwhelming international consensus. By, by now, virtually everybody accepts it, in fact, have for a long time. Uh, Israel reacted, refused to attend the session. Uh, it reacted by bombing Lebanon with no pretext, uh, killing about 50 people. Uh, presumably that was a reaction to the UN meeting. Uh, the United States reacted more politely, namely by vetoing the resolution. Uh, that continued to happen. I won't run through the whole story, uh, but uh, it's been pretty much the record ever since uh, at the General Assembly. Well, I'll skip forward till uh, 1988. In 1988, the Palestinian National Council uh, formally uh, accepted essentially this framework. They tacitly accepted it before. So a two-state settlement, rights of every state in the region, you know, to exist in peace and security, and so on and so forth. Uh, Israel and the United States immediately reacted. Uh, Israel reacted with a formal declaration that uh, there can, I'm quote the words are, there can be no additional Palestinian state between Israel and Jordan. Uh, they declared that Jordan is a Palestinian state. The Jordanians don't think so, and Palestinians don't think so, but remember, they're unpeople, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so there can't be another Palestinian state. And added that uh, the uh, fate of the territories would have to be uh, determined according to the guidelines of the State of Israel. That was essentially a coalition government at the time, Labour, Likud, Paris, Shamir. Uh, the, uh, you know, again, as always, the question is how the United States will react. 
And the United States reacted at once in what's called the Baker Plan, December 1988, I guess, 89. Uh, the Baker Plan essentially just repeated the Israeli formal declaration. So no additional Palestinian state uh, between Jordan and Israel and fate of the territories settled according to the guidelines of um, the state of Israel. Well, uh, a little bit later came uh, uh, the uh, famous Oslo Agreements, a couple of years later. Uh, the Oslo Agreements were heralded as a fabulous uh, uh, breakthrough in the uh, struggle for peace. Uh, Rabin and Arafat met on the White House lawn with you know, Clinton holding him under his arms and uh, sort of Rabin reluctantly shook hands looking the other direction and they issued a declaration of principles. If you read the declaration of principles, it's very short, about two pages, you can see exactly what it meant. It was a total capitulation, 100%. Uh, the Declaration of Principles states that the final outcome of negotiations will be based on UN 242. Now, anyone who knows anything about this story knows that UN 242 says nothing about the Palestinians except refugees. So if that's the final outcome, Palestinians have given up. Uh, and that was understood. Uh, Ed Said criticized it. I criticized a couple of other people. The most important was Haider al Shafi. He was the conservative nationalist, who's probably the most respected person in the territories. And he had, in fact, been heading the negotiations team within the Madrid framework. He rejected it right away. In fact, he refused even to attend the Day of Awe on the White House lawn, and for very simple reasons, uh, exactly what I said. He says this just gives up any hope of national self-determination. And furthermore, he added and stressed, it says nothing about continuing settlement. If Israel continues its settlement programs, then the uh, game's over. Uh, so he refused to attend. Uh, man of, his person of, of principle, one reason he was so respected. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, unfortunate euphoria about it. Well, meanwhile, the settlements continued right through the 90s. You look at the pace of settlement under Clinton, steady increase, uh, peaked actually in the year 2000 with a sharp increase. Uh, also, uh, the US and Israel put into operation at that time a very significant uh, program. Uh, early 90s, they put into operation a program to separate Gaza from the West Bank. Now that happens to be in direct violation of the specific terms of the Oslo Accords, which says they're a territorial unity which can't be broken. But remember, we're talking about uh, international outlaws, the United States and Israel, so they do what they like. Uh, and subordinate educated classes, they can get away with it. Uh, so they immediately began to separate Gaza from the West Bank. That's been persisting since. And that's quite important because it means that if any kind of national entity uh, rights are ever granted to whatever fragments remain in the West Bank, they'll be imprisoned. They'll be imprisoned between Israel and Jordan, Jordanian dictatorship. They'll have no outlet to the outside world, which would have to be Gaza. Of course, they also lose a very important part of Palestinian territory. And that, again, continues until today in pretty ugly ways. Uh, well, I should mention that the settlements are uh, not only illegal, but recognized to be illegal. Uh, you know, there's really no debate about this. Um, Security Council, the International Court of Justice, uh, uh, the United States used to recognize them as illegal too when it was more or less part of the world and now it says they're disputed or something, so you know, the press says disputed. Uh, Israel recognized that they were illegal right away. In late 1967, when the settlements began, Israel's leading uh, uh, illegal advisor, well-known international lawyer, uh, 
Theodore Mehran, now quite a distinguished international legal figure, he advised the government that any settlements at all are in violation of the Geneva Conventions, which says very explicitly you can't transfer population to uh, uh, occupied territory. It's a war crime. Uh, so that's uh, the Israeli Attorney General uh, agreed with that. He formed the government of the same thing. And uh, perhaps the most interesting reaction was uh, Moshe Dayan, he was he's kind of one at the more dovish end of the spectrum, uh, and a person who did have some sympathy for the rights of Palestinians. Uh, he, uh, and he was in charge of the occupied territories, Minister of Defense. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, it's true, it's in violation of international law, but uh, countries violate international law, so we'll do it too. And as long as the boss says it's okay, it doesn't matter what international law is. He also gave a kind of a poetic image to explain what's happening. Well, he said it's, it's a little bit like uh, Bedouin customs. I mean, a Bedouin will kidnap some young girl and rape her and uh, force her to marry him. And ultimately she'll kind of accept it and maybe she'll even think it's a great thing. And that's what will happen with the Palestinians. Uh, he added, uh, we'll inform the Palestinians that uh, we have nothing for you. Uh, you shall live like dogs, and whoever wants to leave can leave, and we'll see where this leads. Meanwhile, we'll continue settlement, and uh, the goal is to have uh, permanent rule over the territories. That's at the dovish end. Uh, so there's no real debate about this in anything involving what's called Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is, you know, is a huge territory, about five times the size of Jerusalem, uh, annexed by Israel. Uh, anything involving Jerusalem is doubly illegal because it's in violation of specific Security Council resolutions uh, relating to uh, Jerusalem. In fact, some of those were even uh, 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 signed on to by the United States when, in the early days when it was still part of the world. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, I won't go through the rest of the record, just to say that there's been one break, one interesting break in the record of total rejectionism on the part of the U.S. and Israel. Now, that was in December 2000, Clinton's last month in office. Uh, Clinton recognized that the proposals in the failed Camp David agreements couldn't be accepted by any Palestinian, any Arab. And he therefore gave a different, uh, pre presented a different framework. It was called his parameters. They were kind of vague, but more forthcoming. He then made a speech saying uh, both Israel and uh, the Palestinians accepted the parameters. Both sides had reservations. And they met in Taba, Egypt, both sides, uh, uh, in January uh, 2001 and uh, tried to hash out their differences. And we actually have a pretty a good record of this. A lot of it in English, a lot more in Hebrew. Uh, and they basically converged. They were getting pretty close. In fact, in their last press conference, both sides said that uh, with a little more time, they might settle everything. Well, the negotiations were broken off at that time by Israel, uh, Prime Minister Barak, uh, and since then, there's been no formal negotiations. Well, that uh, tells us something. It tells us that if an American president is just willing to uh, let, let uh, diplomacy proceed, it might actually uh, implement the international consensus, which I'll stress again is almost exceptionless. Well, this continued. A couple of years later, the quartet was formed, U.S., Europe, uh, Russia, and the U.N., and they issued a road, what's called a roadmap, it's called Bush's Roadmap, uh, which everyone is supposed to live up to. Hamas is constantly denounced because it doesn't accept the roadmap. Uh, less noticed is that Israel immediately rejected the roadmap, roadmap. It formally accepted it, but added 14 reservations, which when you read them completely eliminate its content. Now, this was kept pretty quiet. It came out in public, apart from activists, for the first time in uh, Jimmy Carter's book, you know, the famous book uh, about peace and apartheid. Now, the book was 